and welcome to Start the Beat with Sykes. My name is Sykes and this is my podcast. Before we get started, I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank everyone who checked out the last episode. If you're one of those people, I hope you enjoyed the conversation and thanks so much for coming back. But for those of you out there who are new to the show, welcome. Feel free to make yourselves at home. And as always, there's beer and soda in the fridge. Cheers, my friend. Yes. <sighs> I'm sitting here today with my friend, the one and only, whose name I can't properly pronounce, but I'm going to try, Patrick McAlravioli. I have no fucking idea. What's, work. What, work. Yeah. what's your name, dude? <laughs> How do you pronounce it? Patrick McElravy. McElravy? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. I apologize for all the times that I have butchered the last name pronunciation. It's a curse. It's been going on since elementary school i'm just used to it by this point i'm like whatever you want to call me it's all good it doesn't matter at this point. <laughs> yeah i feel like i've uh definitely tried to like say your name on several occasions with um you commenting on stuff and you asked for it videos and things like yeah. that and i'm like yo shout outs to uh, dude i don't know <laughs> so for anyone that doesn't know you you are a a musician i know you as a musician a very talented vocalist and a couple pretty cool music projects we're here today to talk about that yep. to bullshit just about making music hanging out growing up getting old all that fun stuff so where would we like to start what is it that you do why don't you tell the people what it is that you do are doing oh good lord uh <laughs> uh it, it's kind of crazy because considering the year we've had this has been my busiest year thus far uh nowadays uh, i'm the lead singer and uh guitarist for nine stitch method that's my main project uh i lend my vocal vocals to uh soft the clarity uh it's a <clears throat> online bass project uh between me and my producer gus Wallner, based out of brazil uh Oh God, what other stuff do I do? Um, I have a new uh, project now called Seath. It's like trap metal, industrial type stuff. Uh, I have another project with a dude based out of Yakima, Washington called the Marion Drain Project. Uh, that's slowly starting to kick off whenever we have time to do it and whatnot. And I'm um, the artist manager over at Brutal Business Entertainment. <laughs> wow, that's a whole lot of it's stuff. It's a lot. Not to mention, I got two minions at home, a wife, uh, all the normal adult stuff. It's it's crazy. Not a lot of sleep. Not a lot of sleep. Yeah. So you brought up a whole lot of stuff. Yes, You're sir. doing a lot of things. And I think let's try to tackle this kind of one by one. And I'm curious about the inspiration behind all of these projects and why you're doing what you're doing. Because as you already mentioned, you know, aside from being in a bunch of different projects, you have a family and all of these things. And there's no good reason for any of us to still be doing this bullshit. <laughs> but I imagine you're very passionate about it. Yes, sir. So the first thing that we had was nine stitch method, which I don't know. I don't want to speak on your behalf, but is this like kind of like your main focus of a project? Say, yeah. At this point, it's my main baby. Uh, it's been at the forefront for the last three or four years. Definitely. And this would be a two piece progressive alternative metal yes. band. So two piece because you do not have a human drummer. No, we do not. No, we do not. Uh, I believe you had Skies of Terror on not too long ago, as they would say, all hail the backing track, uh -huh. uh, which it was pretty crazy because I never, this project was a lot of firsts for me. Um, whenever this started, myself and Josh, we were both in different projects. Uh, he was in a two piece that is set up like nine stitch method. They were booking out of the art center in uh, Butler. And I was in a band called Somber Chronicles at the time. They booked us. We got to meet <clears throat> and just down the road, like, I had started kind of singing. I sucked. I wasn't good, but I'd wanted like that to be the only thing I did. So. And how long ago was this? I'm sorry. Uh, 2016. Okay. Yeah. 2016. Wow. We started okay. That. Yeah. It's kind of crazy where time goes, but um, yeah. So we just, I hit up Josh. I was like, yo, like I want to sing, uh, you know, you record a little bit, you do guitar, you know, I think our styles would mesh. Like let's, let's make some magic happen. So we were just shifting emails back and forth. He lives an hour I was currently living in Butler. He lives up in Herman. It's about an hour, hour and 10 minutes north. And that's all it was. It, it wasn't supposed to be anything. And randomly, the one day he hits me up and he's like, yo, I got our first show booked. I'm like, 
what? <laughs> <laughs> and he, he double booked, uh, he double booked us because he had his band and nine stitch method book for it. And do you remember Tim J? No, no. Uh, Tim J. What was his? Oh, I can't remember his promotion. He used to book out of like the, uh, Kino Cafe. He okay. Did, he did Club Diesel for a little bit. Then he went over to, he was booking out of the uh, Black Forge Coffee House in okay. town there for a while. But like Tim's thing was like, you have to sell 15 tickets. Beyond that, you make money, you keep whatever. But he was good for, if you only sold like three tickets, like you didn't get to play. So I told him, I was, I, and this was a dick move on my part. I was like, you know, there's no way we're going to be able to sell 30 tickets between both projects. So one of them's got to go and Josh picked nine stitch method. And then I was like, okay, how the hell are we going to do this? And he's like, well, it's just going to be the, the, the same as I do with live. You're going to sing. I'm going to play guitar. We're going to have backing tracks. I'm like, all, all right. <laughs> so we put together a demo, got a set list together. And yeah, our first show was at the black forge coffee house in Allentown, the uh, first location. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just been, it was, it was rough. It was green. It had been a lot of growing pains and just in general, when you see, and I know because I thought the same thing when I first started this, when you see two guys on stage and that's it, you're just like that, ah, this is going to suck. Well, I mean, you know, it's been a short period of time. I feel like, you know, you guys have gotten some decent traction in a short amount of time. You've been putting out like a lot of really cool music. I remember the first time I heard you guys, I was like, you know, reasonably impressed with the songwriting and i'm somebody that is really particular about mm -hmm. songwriting it's like i don't really care about what kind of music it is it's just like i love the craft of a good song something that's structured really well yes. and i feel like that's something that you guys do really really well i appreciate so that. it seems you. like you're you know probably a really great team and, uh, you know, I'm curious about, you know, prior to this, what was your experience with like songwriting prior, prior to nine SM, <clears throat> I was a guitar player and pretty much in every band, I was always the sole guitar player. So rhythm and lead, uh, and I play, I've played everything from like grunge to, uh, like new metal to like john mayer type acoustic pop type okay. stuff. Uh, my first band was actually a country rock band so i've d done a little bit of everything but it was weird because at first when we started uh, i was simply i'm gonna do vocals you're gonna play guitar just give me whatever you got and he already knew i was a guitar player and liked what i did he, so we did a couple songs he was like bro if you got riffs by all means and then that was kind of and it was weird for me because i never played with another guitar player before or meshed with somebody like sure that. And two totally different people. Like Josh was more of a punk rock kid, uh, metalcore kid. Me, like my main shtick is like new metal and the stuff like the Dillinger Escape Plan, the, okay. the mathy stuff. You know what I mean? Like real techie type stuff. But it it took a little bit to kind of find our sound because there for a while it was like, oh, we got like an alternative rock song, and then oh, we got a real heavy deathcore song. You know what I mean? But after by the after about a year or so, like it really started to click with us working on tracks together and stuff. I think that that's what really drew me to the stuff that I've heard from you so far is that it has like a really cool blend of, you know, like not in a bad way, but like a radio rock accessibility, but with like, you know, some stuff that's like really heavy and very punishing, but yeah. it's still accessible, which I think is not the easiest thing in the world to do. I find that, a lot of metal bands will either you know they push really hard in one direction or the other but finding that blend it's not the easiest thing to do and i think you do it really well oh, i appreciate that it's definitely weird because we go through spurts where it's like oh like we want to write some melodic stuff but then we always get like i'll want to write something and it's kind of funny because i'm the heavy guitarist he's the more melodic player and he'll be like dude i just want to write something crushing and i'm like oh i, I want to write something melodic and it We'll always say we're going to do one thing, but we end up doing another. <laughs> it's just, I don't know, it's just kind of whatever happens. But the main point of the day is like there has to be a point where you can, you know, tap your foot and like get into it. Like we love shifting, like breaking the verse, chorus, first chorus, bridge kind of structure, but we try to keep it where you can still follow along. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think that it's really important to know who you're writing songs for. 
You know, I mean, obviously, if you're in a band, you're writing songs for yourself. Yeah. But if you're going to put them out in front of people and try to get, you know, people that don't know you or even worse, trying to get your friends to listen to it, (laughs) uh, you know, I think you need to have that accessibility and think about what is going to keep a person interested in this song. Exactly. exactly. And it can be really hard sometimes when you're working with other musicians because, you know, a guitar player wants the guitar to be the most important part of the song. Oh, and course, course. a drummer wants to be the drums to be, the, you know, yeah. everybody has this ego, whether they want to admit it or not. And just finding that balance. But I mean, you really lucked out because there's only two of you motherfuckers. in this. Yeah. Band. It's, it's, yeah. Yes. <laughs> like I said, coming from bands in the past, it was kind of, when it came down to this, the writing, it, the, the weirdest thing for me about it was sharing that guitar writing ability with somebody else. But we just, it was just, organic it just mashed it there was no work or there was really no growing pains that come along with it you had mentioned that your first band or one of your first bands was a, a country rock band yes but then you also told me like you know your metal background is coming from more of like you know a mathy dillinger escape plan yep. sort of thing so i'm curious about the origins of this country rock band was it like a thing like i just want to play in a band and i know these people are doing this so i'm gonna roll with this or is that like a thing that you're into as well um i mean i'm into pretty much all kinds of music uh the country band was called jack's brother jim and mm-hmm. that was the very first band that i ever played in and uh I was working at a construction company called Brayman Construction based out of Saxonburg. And the drum I worked with the drummer in the yard, uh, me and the lead singer and guitarist at the time, Joe, he, him and I got hired in at the same time. And it would just kind of click, you know, like, oh, you play music? Yeah, yeah, I play music. Fuck it. Let's just jam, you know? Hell yeah. And so I played bass and it was fun. Like we did a lot of, you know, we wrote a couple originals and stuff. But like, like I said, I'm a guitar player. I was playing bass and I'm like, well, like for these originals, like what if I, you know, I would bring riffs to the table, but I would want to play that live. And that was, that, that was kind of where that was kind of where the fork. So I was like, guys, I mean, like we we need to find somebody else for bass. Let me play guitar. Maybe Joe can just focus on singing and whatnot. And they're like, eh. And it was it, it is what it is. It were was. You, were you there. listening to like any country rock at the time or like prior to that? I'm curious about like you know like your experience as a listener and then becoming a contributor to the style i was i i was force fed country more or less mm. um like uh my stepdad like that's all he listened to it was either we're listening to froggy 101 in the car or like we're watching like the country western station because you know we were younger and stuff at the time and my grandfather's side that's who i got my first guitar from like that's all they did is like the og like bluegrass and country and stuff awesome and i didn't really learn to appreciate it until you you know like when i was in my mid-20s i was like okay like it actually like makes sense now but uh and that project like really didn't pat like it was it was a stepping stone for me it was kind of learning like the dynamic of people and working with people because you know how it is you've been in bands for how many years now it's shell shock learning how to work with different yeah. people different egos attitudes the give and take the pull and all that did you find yourself maybe developing any more of an appreciation for that kind of music after playing it absolutely especially bluegrass um bluegrass in my opinion is one of the there's some shredders d- yeah exactly that was my thing <laughs> yeah. like, you listen to it, you're just like oh that's just like that hillbilly stuff but like there's really some crazy stuff that goes on in yeah that. and so yeah over time like i got older and like i said like i've always tried to keep an open mind like over time, like like I said, I just learned to develop that appreciation that a lot goes into that a lot more than it gets credit for, in mm-hmm. my opinion. I think that, you know, over time, having an open mind and doing all of that, I think, really ties into the next thing that I want to talk about that you're doing, which would be this new project, Seethe. Yes, yes. I find that, you know, this would be something that I wouldn't maybe necessarily... 1000% expect somebody that, you know, played in a, you know, listened to Dillinger escape plan and then played in a country rock band for a little bit, you know, to yeah. do something like this. And this is like, how about you describe what this is from, well, from your words? Okay. So you're probably with me on this. You're probably your gateway into metal was most likely stuff along the lines of like slipknot, uh, a Def, little deaf tones corn maybe you a little know, like, bit earlier but yeah for yeah, sure yeah but like a huge the um queen of the dam soundtrack was like a huge thing for me okay i, I love them new metal vocals over top of the electronic stuff 
And I always wanted to do a project akin to that, but doing solo stuff by yourself, like when you don't, it, it to like a solo artist everywhere, I give you guys all the credit in the world because it is nerve wracking. Because if I write a song, if you and I are playing together, I write a song and I bring it to you, you're going to tell me if you dig it or if it sucks, you know, or you're going to work on it until you get there. But by yourself, you're just like, yes, but is it good? Is it just me? Uh huh. You know? And I wanted to, you know, we, we, when COVID happened, it was like, well, shows are taken away from me. We have this EP that we have recorded. But like we want to wait to see what happens. But I want to record and I want to write music. So I started just delving into beats on YouTube and stuff like that. And I found trap metal, which that was interesting to say the least, because I, I that genre is definitely interesting. There's a lot. There's a lot of good stuff. I think there's a lot of bad stuff. I think too. most of it that I've heard is dog shit. I agree with you. But like, what's <clears throat> the ones that are good really shine? And I was just like, okay, like. But the music is what got me, though. It wasn't necessarily the vocals. So I was like, okay, like I wanted to do this kind of queen to the damned electronic type stuff. And this stuff is heavy. It's got the heavy bass and whatnot. Fuck it. We're going to try and we're going to go for it. And it was nerve wracking to say the least, but I was showing people <laughs> demos and whatnot. And they're like, dude, that's actually pretty cool. Like you got that Manson type vocals. You know, you got the heavy vocals. It's aggressive, but it's. So I just said hell with it and went for it. I had the downtime. I just poured myself into it. and Yeah, I was. I mean, I think that I played it on. You yeah, asked it was, for yeah, it. It was circles. Yeah. And I was like, wow, like <laughs> under any normal circumstances, this is something that I would 110 percent hate. Yeah. But I really thought that it was good. I thought it was produced really well. And I will agree with you in terms of a lot of that trap metal stuff that i hear the production is usually pretty good but then there's just this like really lackluster vocal on it yeah so it was cool to hear good production with a good vocalist well, that, that has like dynamic range well that's another interesting thing too about that genre is it's the opposite of everything i ever known so like okay we're both in metal bands you know, the thing you want, like you want to get the best possible polished product that you have to present and show for yourself. But like in that genre, it's weird, dude. Like I was told by multiple people that like, dude, this is too clean. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, really? Like, it, like, yeah. Like it was like, it was too clean. It was too polished. And then the anime AMV thing, I don't know exactly understand what goes on with that genre in anime, but that was another thing that like, well, like you need like the lyric videos cool and all but like you need some like anime and stuff like to be true to the genre it was, like i said it's just what yeah it's just it, i'm just like okay okay <laughs> I'm, dude I'm, fuck <laughs> that all that you need to do with any style of music is to do what you want to fucking do that's my point like yes, why the exactly. fuck like oh because somebody else had an anime video so now i need one too yeah pretty much fuck that crazy, dude. dude like i can't wrap my head around it but it's just like all right like what i'm just gonna do my own thing i've always been like that you know i've always been one to take criticism you know obviously sometimes you get butt hurt over criticism but you know you take it you're like okay can i apply this is it worth applying but at the end of the day i just do what i want and just <laughs> whatever i think that you know your diverse background in listening to music and making music makes all the sense in the world for why I think this seed stuff is turning out so diverse well, and so that. just, it seems like it's just really well thought out because like, I think regardless of what kind of music you make, you need to have some experience in the language of music. If you want to speak it well, Fully agreed. not to sound like, I feel like that's kind of like a douchey thing to say because like there are plenty of inexperienced people that make great music. It's true. But I think that it, most of the time, I would say, I could I would put it on 10 out of 10. Dog shit musicians are people that just do not have any knowledge of music or experience listening to a lot of music. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. You got to, like, for example, okay, we're going back to, like, the mathy stuff. Like, that has, a, like, obviously, that's more popular nowadays than what it was in the past. And, like, it's crazy talent. But a lot of people don't fuck with it because like musicians like you and I, like we would love that because we understand what goes into that. We can't, but the normal passerby, they're going to be like, it just sounds like a 
barrage of noise and notes. There's nothing that catches my ear. But like you have to have an understand a fundamental of how you're going to pull them in and keep them in for the long ride. And yeah, a lot of people, they don't have that. They don't understand that. It's just, it's just how it is. Yeah. So, I mean, it seems like, you know, your background had a lot of music in it yeah. and family and people around you. Yes. I'm curious about, you know, whenever you started turning into a little metalhead, how was that <laughs> in the house with so, the people around you? So that was crazy. Okay. So <clears throat> I was in public school up until I went to Seneca Valley school until seventh grade. And when we hit, I was in seventh, my brother was in fifth and we got yanked out and we went to church schools up until my senior year. Okay. And with them schools, like the first one was a Baptist school. We weren't allowed to like even Christian rock, Christian metal. That was like of the devil. Like we weren't allowed to listen to any of that. It was strictly like Gaither, the Gaither brothers and all kind of stuff like that. Um, we were allowed to get paddled in school and like women weren't allowed to wear pants or anything like that. It was just like, you know, long skirts, at least, you know, to the knee and what. Sure. Like, and it, like, but that's whenever I started getting into metal. Uh, one of the first albums I bought was Iowa Slipknot. That'll do it. And like, I, I seen, uh, what was it? My Plague. It was the edited version. I was a clean vocals, heavy guitars. Okay, this is cool. I bought the album and like, because I was in that church environment, like I felt guilty. I threw it away. And it, 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 it was, it was just so, it was just so much, you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, you know, it's a, like, it was just like, Whoa, dude, this is crazy. You know? And then, but then, uh, it was stuff like, uh, the Apex theory incubus. Uh, I didn't get into like corn and Deftones until later, but, um, it was bands like that that kind of started drawing me into it. And then, I got into like, I bought, I ended up rebuying that Slipknot album again. Uh, and then from there, I wanted heavier stuff. So I got into bands like Between the Buried and Me um, and uh, Cattle Decap and all that kind of shit. Sure. So, and the whole time, I'm not supposed to be listening to this stuff. Like the school district would send a bus to pick us up and take us to our school. And like, I used to listen to whatever on the way and I would keep it in my backpack and my locker. Well, my aunt, at the time ratted me out to the preacher and said, I was listening to like, so I get, no, what? Hey, yo, dude, I'm not even kidding. Oh, uh, they no. had, like, cause my mom, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she ratted me out. Uh, the one day I was upstairs in my room and she come over and I didn't know she was there. Cause like we kept that. Cause she went to the same church, had her son in the same school and whatnot and born of a broken man by rage against the machine i had it blaring upstairs just rocking out to it you know uh-huh and she heard that and was like give me the lyric book and dude i got like the, I got, uh, oh man no and like then that next week <laughs> she ratted me out the preacher comes thank god i forgot my fucking walkman and stuff at home but he comes up and he's going through all my shit in my locker he's like i know i know you're listening to music it's bad and stuff i will catch you and i'm like no you're not motherfucker <laughs> <laughs> sure but yeah dude it was it was crazy man it was crazy that's so wild like i wonder if they realize like in that moment they just made it 10 times worse for like like you know like there's no way you're going back now pretty much yeah it's, it's already <laughs> here. and then from there i just got into progressively heavier stuff and heavier stuff and it's just that's just the way it's been but now i mean you're a productive member of society with a family mm. i mean i don't know your whole backstory if there's been any terrible things that have happened but you seem reasonably well together now yeah yeah for the most part yeah little unhinged but i think everybody's got their little quirks oh, and stuff like oh that. yeah yeah and i wonder whose fault do you think that is the the, the people that raised us or the cds that we listen to yeah it was definitely the people. <laughs> definitely the people good lord oh my god everyone's got stories everyone's got stories oh my god not that anyone wants to hear them but yeah it definitely it's it's weird like that's a weird way to look at everything like oh they're listening to corn they're you know just uh i don't know it's just something they don't understand yeah i find that like you know i always find people with your story rather like i don't know if fascinating is the right word for it but i grew up in a much different situation mm -hmm. like my parents were very young when they had me and my parents listened to metal like my dad had cannibal corpse cassette tapes and shit That's what's up. so i just grew up around metal so there was never this weird thing where like I had to like, 
I wasn't worried about like my parents or people finding my music. I was worried about like my dad realizing that I had one of his tapes and taking it back. So I couldn't yeah. listen to it yeah. anymore. And, but I find that because of that, there's a certain like appreciation for heavy music that like I don't have in the sense of like, I feel like I took it for granted for so long just cause like, you know, like when I was growing up, it was like, you know, like my dad tried to send me to school, uh, first grade picture day wearing an iron maiden shirt and my mom like caught him and stopped it <laughs> so like metal's been this part of my life now where like i didn't start feeling like guilty or like weird about listening to music until i started like liking hip-hop because like nobody in my life listened to that stuff and i grew up uh, in Wilkinsburg and I had a lot of friends that listened to rap. I was in Pittsburgh public and mm -hmm. things like that. No, nobody that I knew listened to the metal shit. Yep. So it was like at school, the kids were listening to like, you know, like Tupac and mm -hmm. Biggie and some beastie boys and like all that stuff. But at home, I couldn't listen to that stuff because I couldn't, I wasn't allowed to That's listen to that okay, stuff. Okay, okay. So it was funny where it was like, you know, I just wasn't, allowed to listen to like what was popular like, that was the dangerous music for me yeah you know not the cannibal corpse tapes that my dad had but like it was the like, gangster rap. yeah like nelly and jaw roll and whatever was, <laughs> whatever well a little yeah. bit a little bit earlier than that how old are you 30 just you're 30. 30 okay so i'm 35 okay so i'm just a like a, a few years ahead that's yeah. funny like when you were talking about like listening to like slipknot and corn and stuff like that like mm -hmm. it's like that was like when i was like just getting into high school when that stuff happened so like it was like i'm just like the like the wave behind you yeah which is funny but uh yeah just that whole thing of uh fucking like music being dangerous <laughs> and things like that oh, man so i'm curious now um you mentioned that you know you have a family yeah how is the family support for all of your extracurricular activity Honestly, i you know it's one of them things i see a lot of people you know because we're getting older obviously like you said you're 35 on 30 you know uh a big thing with people our age is you know now most of us have kids we have families and we do this on the side and a lot of times i see a lot of friction like you know and that's something I've never had to worry about. Uh, my wife's always been supportive of something she learned and understood very early on that this is a part of me. And my kids, dude, my kids love music. It, it, it's one of them things like, okay, we'll be at a show <clears throat> and we're playing. My wife will be live streaming it on Facebook and my sister-in-law's watching them. And she'll be like, all right, daddy's playing. And they'll watch it. And they'll be like moshing around and stuff like yeah daddy's a rock star yeah <laughs> or we'll be we'll be in the car and you know sometimes they're not old enough yet to realize how uncool i am but they'll be like daddy <laughs> daddy put, put on your rock star music you know so like it's like oh yes i still got him for a little bit longer all right <laughs> so yeah there's a uh, very very blessed in that considering everything i do and the amount of time that it occupies on my life i dude it couldn't be any better i think that I would imagine that a lot of that just boils down to communication. It's true. And like, you know, it's very, yeah. showing your passion for it. And then also just like being there for the things that you need to be there for. Yeah, exactly. And that was something whenever I was younger, like communication and whatnot, that was something I definitely struggled with. Like she, I'd be like, yo, we're going to practice. And she'd be like, what the fuck me? I plan, you know? And it wasn't because she was bad. I was going to practice. It was just, I never relayed. Oh yeah. Like, I'm having practice at two o'clock on Saturday. You know, yeah. Should, we already had plans and stuff made. So that, that, you know, that was probably like the most friction I'd say out of everything I had. Yeah. I still struggle with this with my girlfriend in the terms of like, I won't always tell her everything that's going on mm, yeah, and it's yeah. not a malicious thing. No, it's not. It's just kind of like, well, okay. I know that she's going to be at the studio working on pottery stuff all day on Sunday. So I don't feel the need to bring up to her that I'm recording podcasts yes. at the house, but she still just wants to know yeah. what's going on. It's like, whether it is important or not, your significant other wants to know everything that's happening, whether they're a part of it or not. They just want to know. And it took me forever to realize that. Yes, 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 indeed. <laughs> yes. Are you an only child? Do you have any siblings? Uh, 
Uh, there's me. Uh, I have my brother, Ryan. And then we have our half-brother, Dallas. Then I've had a slew of, <laughs> not to knock my dad or anything, but I've, <laughs> <laughs> I've, had, a slew, I've had a slew of step-siblings okay, over the years, okay. if you will, you know. All right. I was curious because I find that, like, where that attitude comes from with me is, like, I'm an only child. Okay. So okay. I'm not used to, I'm an only child. My parents ended up splitting up whenever I was pretty young and I was just kind of like yeah. bounced back and forth from grandma. So, so I basically was like left to fend for my own mm -hmm. always. I never had to tell anybody what I was doing. Yeah. So now like, as I've gotten older, I'm in my mid thirties. Yeah. I'm like, I'm now I'm kind of grippling, grip, grippling, grappling yeah. with the idea that like, Oh, it's a good idea to let the people in your life know what you're doing. It's true. I'm it's so true. used to just not. Well, like, <laughs> like, a person, like for me, like, like, for example, like you and I are talking about this stuff or like me and people from other bands talk about this stuff. And like a lot of times I just assume nobody wants to hear about all this crazy shit that I'm doing. You know, it'd be it running the label, working on this project, working on that project and like how are things going. And I'm just like, oh, you know, just kind of the same old, same old, same old, Dude. you know. And then my wife will be like, bro, like you're doing, yeah. you're doing this, you're doing that. And like, oh, uh -huh. you do that stuff. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, <laughs> that that. The how are things going conversation is such a nightmare for me because I find that I'm like a criminally modest person. I don't like to talk about what I'm doing because I'm much, I don't, it's like, I feel like, you know, if we're hanging out right now yeah. and like, say I'm at like a, like a cookout with like my girlfriend's family or some shit like that. It's like, nobody wants to hear about my dumb death metal band, but on the contrary, a lot of the time people do want to hear true. what you're doing because people true. like hearing you know, not necessarily that's a, a success story, but people like to hear other people doing well and people like that energy. And I need to stop being such a fucking pessimist all the time and just tell people about what I'm doing. Well, that's always been an issue with me. Like I've always like with stuff like this and podcast interviews and stuff where, you know, you're supposed to be there to talk about you. I always end up deflecting onto other projects are like what are you doing you know what's going on with gray walker or like yeah dude like uh ocean i'm just gonna shoot out an example like oceans to ash they just dropped a new single you know you, you know i deflect onto other things like that you know shout outs to those guys what a good fucking band oh yes sir yes sir indeed love them guys but uh yeah i always end up deflecting on other people just because i don't want to sound like an egotistical prick yeah that's, that's i think that thing. for a very long time i was really concerned about being like too self-promotional, too mm -hmm. egotistical. But with the way the internet and social media is now, everybody to. is a fucking rock star. Yep. And it's almost weirder if you're not talking about yourself. Mm -hmm. It's very true. You know, I, I've i like this past week, I kind of had like a little bit of a social media detox. I didn't post any like vlogs or anything. And uh, I don't think a lot of people noticed, which is a convenient thing for me because I'm not like some huge fucking YouTuber or something where I'm like committed to a release schedule. Like I cannot do anything for a month and most people will be like, Oh yeah, Brian, he's probably working on some gray Walker stuff. You know, I'm not like yeah. committed to anyone else's expectations, yeah. but you know, I took that break and I'm feeling really good about it. And, but if I do happen to look at my phone and I see like, you know, you put out a song or something. It just pumps me up. It like makes me want to like get shit done. And I yep. want to be putting things out all the time, but not because like, I think that I'm better than you or I, you know, I just, it's like, I love that. energy. it just makes me want to do stuff. But yeah, like yeah, having that, uh, being reserved and like realizing it's like, I don't need to do stuff every single day because people don't have time for me every day. Yeah. And to think otherwise is stupid. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 100%. Uh, and that's kind of like, yeah, I don't think I could have said that any better to be honest. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cause everybody's always doing something nowadays and there's always like Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is such a, pull that mic a little bit closer to you. Pittsburgh's not such a populated, you know, I thought there for a while, like I had a pretty good handle I, I always think I have a good handle on shit until Mil Millvale Music Festival comes around and then they announce the bands that are playing. You realize how many bands you don't know. Oh, dude. It's it's ridiculous. I, I you know, I've said this ten thousand fucking times on this goddamn show. I've been doing this show for five years. You know, this is episode I believe this will be three hundred and thirty five. 
That's a lot of episodes. That's a lot of episodes. And I am not running out of motherfuckers to nope. talk to. Nope. Is your beer empty? Yes, sir. You want to go get another I one? I think I'm going to go. Do you need another one? I'll take another beer. Hell yeah, let's do it. <laughs> I'm going to... I've never done this before, but I think I'm going to make a little animation called Beer Break <laughs> and put it up and have like a little jingle. That sounds like a spectacular... I need to put in some... <laughs> loud sound effects fill the void when you're looking at the wave file brian that's because you need to edit here i normally don't edit the episodes at all so i need to like make a note for myself so i remember oh there you go there you go there's still a good chance that i'll completely forget this will just be <laughs> in the fucking thing it's gritty it gives a character i think that Aside from that concept that we were just talking about of realizing that you don't need to put, you need to put yourself out there. I mean, a lot of people are always talking about that as artists, yes. but you don't have to put, if you put yourself out there too much, it's exhausting for your friends. It's exhausting yes. for your family. It's exhausting for people that don't even know who you are. It's just exhausting if you put your stuff out there too much. But what I was going to say on top of that, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really weird line to find. Like, at what point do you tone it back a little bit or just give a couple days? You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I try, like, well, for the Brutal Business page, we post on there a lot. You know, I try to go through different projects and happenings and stuff. But for, like, the band, like, I'll try to do, like, maybe one post for the day and then you know maybe give it a couple days or something like that you know if there's no shows or anything going on you know just post up a song here and there but there's no need to cry you know it's just overwhelming and it's like all right dude we know Shut so why up. don't we this is actually a, probably a pretty good opportunity to talk about brutal business entertainment what the fuck is this <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty crazy okay so there's a band out of Butler called uh, Over My Dead Body. When Nine Stitch Method first started, um, we played at the Lindora Hotel. And that night it was Over My Dead Body, Nine Stitch Method, and Skippy, Skippy Ickham. And there was, there was another band. They're, they form like half of Animus now. I can't remember the name of the band for the life of me. But anyway, so like Skippy Ickham, I heard of his music. But like I didn't know him as a person or anything. Like I was kind of like a Fairweather fan. He's a horrorcore rapper and stuff. Very big around the Pittsburgh area and stuff. Uh, like we played the show with him. He was cool. Dug his tunes. Like we just met in passing. But I seen like all of his merch had brutal business and whatnot. So like I looked into it a little bit. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Like he runs a label and whatnot. So we never really talked again. But I kept paying attention to brutal business. And I was like, okay, that's cool. That's cool. That's cool. All right. And when Josh and I started like kind of getting more serious and whatnot, we uh, self-recorded our first, I guess you could call it full length, uh, Life After You. We started getting on like some online radio stations and podcasts and stuff around Pittsburgh. And I was like, I think I'm going to hit them up. They're all rap. But like, I like the formula and I like the way they do everything. And yet he's like, I, I, don't, I don't care. So I reached out to Garrett. We had, you know, we talked back and forth for a couple of weeks and we were the first metal band to get signed to Brutal Business Entertainment. And, you know, we played a lot of cool shows together. We got to travel with them guys a little bit, you know, like around the tri-state area to shows and whatnot. Uh, they were very accepting of us. They were kind of like, yes, something besides horrorcore rap. You know, they were, they, they were <laughs> extremely like they, sure. they, they were extremely generous and great to us and took us in and gave us a lot of really cool opportunities right off the get go. And we meshed along with everybody and uh fast forward like a year and a half later how it come about i don't know but i run brutal business entertainment now uh that's been a wild ride to say the least but uh we got a lot of cool things coming up it's definitely been a hard year with not having shows not being able to go places and whatnot but taking over the management because i was as soon as we started i was already kind of behind the scenes like i really wanted to get do a lot of things and get my hands wet and dirty you know and get in the mix and got you know i was behind the scenes helping garrett and you know the other bands and whatnot 
And just over time, Garrett was like, I'm thinking of stepping down. You want to keep it going? You want, you know, you're the only person I'm willing to pass the torch off to. And I was like, <gasps> terrifying. You know what I'm saying? But I was like, yeah, like, I think I could do this. This is something I legit, like, have always wanted to do. But to get from that, it, it's just weird how shit plays out. Like, it was, wasn't anything I set out to do. It's just kind of what happened. So I'm curious about that position of your mentality because it's one thing to play music yep. play shows that's all most of these motherfuckers around here want to do mm. a lot of people that are super talented are complete turds when it comes to actually marketing and trying to put together some sort of a brand for their band and push it but it seems like you guys have been really good about you know with the nine stitch method stuff with the seethe stuff like you're really good about just like okay i'm gonna get a you know a lyric video produced or i'm gonna have cool artwork or now with the brutal business stuff i'm gonna help push things and i'm gonna you know it's it just seems like it's very like it seems like you give a fuck and like the thing that i'm most curious about with this podcast in general and just talking with people is talking with people that give a fuck about what they're doing and that's why i wanted to talk to you to be completely honest it's just it just seems like you give a fuck I do. so I like do. what do you think it is about i mean this is again we were just talking about not being egotistical and now this is going to be a rather egotistical focused <laughs> question but what do you think it is about you that sets you apart from somebody that maybe doesn't give a shit about any of this sort of stuff like what is the drive for you to want to take this, these extra steps when it comes down to it like especially with where i'm at now um if you'd have told me five years ago i'd be fronting a two-man band opening up for national acts traveling i would have laughed you'd have told me i was because like i said i've only i haven't been singing that long you'd have told me i was fronting a band you told me i'd have been running a label i would have laughed but the thing is is just i've always you know we're all our own worst critics and the thing is, is like, whenever you get up in the morning, what do you want to do? The first thing that comes to my mind is writing and playing music. Whenever I should be sleeping because I just work night shift, I'm writing music. Uh, when people are playing video games, I'm writing music. Whenever I should be doing shit around the house while the kids are napping, since I have that time, <laughs> I'm typically recording and writing music. <laughs> yeah, it's just what it, you know, and it's just the brain doesn't, it, it's, a, it's a gift and a curse. Like my brain just, doesn't shut off uh and but i just always want to like i look around my peers and i see you know what they're doing and i'm like dude like i want to get to that level and it's just how do i do it you know just keep pushing and like for example i started singing i was like okay like i can kind of do this okay then you know you don't listen to your demo for a while six down the months down the road and you're like oh my god i put out that garbage Okay, so the next batch of tunes, I'm going to work on that a little bit more, and I'm going to try to up the ante. You know, just tearing down, building up, tearing down, and building up. That's pretty much what it's been. And it's weird because I went from people telling me, you need to stick with guitar. You know, you just don't have it as a vocalist to, dude, I got more recording projects and collabs than I can keep up with. It's just, it's just total 360, and it, it's weird to think about and because a lot of times people hit me up or they even when they comment on stuff i'm just like they praise me and i'm just like you heard my shit right like are you for real it's just it's just crazy it's just weird it's something i still have trouble wrapping my head around i'm curious about you know every artist has this self-doubt that they have to sort of wrestle sure. with but it feels like the self-doubt that you may have about your vocal ability doesn't really seem to stop you at all it seems like even if you realize that like something isn't good it's you're just kind of like oh well maybe i'll it, my impression is that you're like okay that thing that i put out six months ago is bad but i know i could do better and i'm gonna work towards it instead of yeah. just being like i'm gonna stop yeah it's it's never like i'm happy for a minute like i'm proud of it but i always like like i said i just I tear it down and I'm like, okay, like your vocal wasn't bad here, but like your screams were killer, but the vocals were, you need to put more oomph into it. You know, you need to be a little more melodic or something like it's just, it, it's weird because for as confident as I am in my abilities, I'm unconfident. And I feel like once you get complacent, 
with anything, you know, that's just, that's, that's where the train ride ends. I think the, the, the best thing that we can do, you know, as an artist is to know that like, you got to figure out it's that you got to know when like, you can't get good without being bad. Exactly. You have to, everything has to start from somewhere. Yeah. Like I said, I was talking about releases and whatnot. Everything's a time capsule. You know, so like personally, like Nine Stitch Method literally just dropped our newest EP on Friday. And in my opinion, that's the best vocal anything I've put out to date. And I listened back to the beginning uh, of our first demo and I was like, oh, like, but you know, you can see that the hard work and the time spent into the craft has paid off. You know what I mean? So like there's, there's what's the word? There's appreciation in that when you can see that, but it's like now, okay, what am I going to do the next time around? Where am I going to take it? So I think that like, it gets to a point where that's the only thing that is really exciting about continuing to make music. Yeah, pretty much. It's just like, like, how can I impress myself next? Mm -hmm. Or like, what can I do that I haven't done before? Yeah. How can I push the boundaries? Yes. Especially when you're like operating on a level that like we are just as like independent musicians, yeah. because it's not like we have, uh, you know, fucking it's not like we're millions of fans yeah. that are fucking expecting something from yes. us. Like we could do whatever we want. So, the drive is definitely more selfish, I think, than monetary. I'll give you that too. And the other thing is, things are so much different nowadays than whenever you know we were in high school and whatnot, just getting into this thing. We live in an age where now people want instant gratification; they want the next thing. Like if you're, and like that's why like a lot of artists they're just dropping singles now. Mm -hmm. People don't want to listen to a full album. And, you know, you have to keep pushing content. Like, we were just watching uh, Deathlehem a little bit ago. Yeah, their tunes are killer. They're putting out albums and whatnot. But they're also putting out content where with the videos and the skits and whatnot. Because if you don't do that stuff, if you don't keep pushing stuff, you become obsolete. And, you know, that's obviously the last thing anybody wants. So, it's just... That go, grind, grind, grind. That goes grind. back to that conversation, though. Is like, like, what is too much? Exactly. And like, what is exactly. not enough? Yeah. It's so hard trying to figure out that balance. Yeah. And like, I'm like really stuck right now with um, this new Sykes and the New Violence material because I've, I'm old. And I'm an album guy. I don't like dropping singles. Yes. But we've we've put out two singles from our new album, and I have another one. And I'm like, okay, do I just want to put this out? Or I mean, we're a song and a half away from finishing the album, or should I just wait? But yeah. is it like, or is anybody going to listen to this album? And is it going to be? Am I going to get more attention to each song if I just release them as singles, and yep. then maybe down the line I put it out as an album on yep. Spotify for anyone that wants to listen to yeah. it? Because I'm the same way. Personally, I'm an album guy. I love downloading it, buying it, whatever, getting in the car. Well, and then dude, just, you have that like uh, that memory of like you know like buying something that yep. you felt so fucking bad about that you had to throw <laughs> away, but it was like this thing, you know, yep. and like you remember lyric books that you know your fucking aunt or whoever it was yep. could fucking read and then tell on the goddamn preacher, or the pastor, or whatever the fuck it was. Mm. I, where are you at with religion in your life? I know this is maybe a bit of a weird okay, question. Okay. No, that's, that's not. But I'm okay. curious. Like, okay. Uh, I don't even know how I would say it. Um, a big thing for me is like, I look at my kids and I think there's like, there's something out there. It could be God. It could be Buddha. I don't know. Sure. You know, sure. But, um, but, I'm at the point in my life where I believe there's something out there that's bigger than all of us. You know, I don't think, you know, I believe in science, but you know, I don't exactly believe that one day it was the big bang and everything just started evolving and into the way it is today. But in my opinion, as far as the church and whatnot goes, like I think churches are good and like they do stuff for the community and whatnot. But in my opinion, you know, religion is man and their take on it. And you get the business side of it wrapped up in it. You know, you have a social pro quo, you know, with upkeep, you know, money and whatnot. It's just, 
to me, it's just a sham. You know, it's a sp- yeah, I think that they're with anything. That and, I, is- and that's not me saying like, oh, like F the church and stuff. Like sure. That. But it's just it, it, with my my upbringing, because there was a point in time I was in the church seven days a week. And like there was a lot of people I was just like, dude, like you're more screwed up and messed up and, you know, ignorant. Sure. Than, than a lot of the people that don't go to church. You know what I mean? So I don't know. Like I, I have a kind of a weird wishy-washy way of looking at it. I have doubt, but I don't have doubt. I think that that's honestly the most human answer that like anybody can have regarding this stuff because I didn't have a religious upbringing and I was very much a stereotypical metalhead kid. You know, uh, I'm an atheist, you know, fuck God, blah, blah, blah. But that's just because like I had cradle of filth CDs, not because I had any real issue with God, but also like my grandmother who I spent a lot of time, she practically like raised me. She was a very religious person, but she was also like, she had a lot of things going on where like, I knew there was like a certain sense of sense of like disconnection and dementia tied to her religion because she just wasn't mentally well. And, but I never like, and I never was like, I think like any ignorance or like fuck God that I had was very like adolescent. And as I got older, I started to appreciate the sides of religion that were just like, okay, well, this is like a moral compass for a lot of people that don't have anything else. I couldn't have said that. Anymore. And I think that that's like really important. I think it's like really narrow minded to not realize that for a lot of people, this is all they have. You know what I mean? Like, you know, for me, you know, like without be everybody needs some sort of a religion and ever. And, you know, for me, it's like, okay, sure. Mine was like art and music. You know, those are the things that I had to turn to when I had nothing else. You know, I had fucking slipknot CDs and stuff that I could listen to. And I was like, this, this is like, this is the, the release that I get from engaging in this other people get from going to church and to take that away from them is really ignorant. Yes. But with that being said, there is definitely people that are very malicious in the church for sure. Yeah. But there's people that are malicious in every facet of life because people are just evil and everybody's capable of it. Yep. And, uh, but I was like super curious about what your background was with that. Cause I think like religion's like one of those weird things that, it seems like I'm surprised at like how not accepted religion has become as like a mainstay. It's like, especially with a lot of the like COVID-19 stuff, you see these charts of things that are dangerous to do. Yeah. It's like, it's like the number one thing is like going to a bar. And then the number two thing is like going to a church. I'm like, what? Yeah. Like, are we really, it's like, how am I living in a society that simultaneously demonizes alcohol and God? It's like, no, it's, it's like, cause, cause like there used to be a it, time yes. where it was like, you know, like, oh, you know, like booze, like booze is the thing. Fuck God. Or like, you know, don't, don't go to liquor, go to God. But now none of that stuff is okay. No, no. <laughs> it's so weird. Well, yeah. Well, like, for example, even like restaurants and stuff like that, like you can go, when you walk into the restaurant, you have to have a mask. When you sit down and eat, you don't have to have the mask on. Now, granted, there's people coming into the restaurant, passing by you, your waiters coming back and forth, dealing with all kinds of other people. But if you got to get up to go and take a piss, like COVID's just like waiting in the bathroom, like, oh, I'm going to get you. Oh, you know, because yeah. you have to have the mask on to go to the bathroom. But you're okay being around a group of people. I don't care if you're six feet apart or not, you know, in the booth eating your food. You don't have to have a mask on. Yeah. It's safe. It's good. It's like, you know, I'm. <sighs> I think that I wouldn't mind the fact that people couldn't go to church if it wasn't so like every time I'm watching something, they're always talking about it. Like they make it like they're always bringing it up like in this way that makes it seem like religion is a bad thing that you shouldn't be taking part in right now. And I'm not a religious person, but I just think that it's like crazy that they just keep bringing it up. They bring it up more than live music. And I think that live music is a far more dangerous situation than church. And arguably there are way more people that would go see a live concert that would want to see a live concert right now than go to church. Yeah. So it's just weird to me, like how the media is like being very anti church. 
Mm-hmm. It's a good thing that I'm not like a fucking Joe Rogan where my <laughs> my my podcast is going to get clipped and like you know I'm going to get put on blast for yeah. saying people should go to church. That's not what I'm saying. I get it. I just think that it's it's fucking weird, man. Yes. But you know, like where are you at in terms of your potential concerns with everything that's going on obviously you're here we're hanging out face to face we're talking we're having some beers and you also mentioned too i asked you before we started and i didn't mean to ask you a question then cut you off so i apologize (laughs) but before we started uh you know you live about an hour outside of pittsburgh where we are now so you're in a smaller town and i'm that's why i asked like when you were talking, we were talking about things that are going on. I asked, you know, like, where do you live? Because I think that like the reaction to this virus and why people are so like, why isn't anybody taking it seriously? It's like, I don't think that people aren't taking it seriously. I just think the majority of people that live in America live in towns like where you live, where it's a smaller thing. It's not these like huge congested cities where everyone's living on top of each other and like constantly on the subway and all this other shit. Yeah. Like, like out there it's people like personally, like, like obviously I don't want to wear the masks. There is a virus. Like I know people that have gotten really sick from it, you know, thankfully knock on wood. Nobody's died from it, but it, it, you know, like, is it inconvenient? Yes. But you know, in my opinion, just put the damn thing on. You're protecting other people from getting sick. Sure. And, but it, it, there's certain places like, like out in that more rural area, you know, people are just kind of like, mm, fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm not going to wear it. You know, the workers will wear it. Some people in the store will wear it. There's just some people who don't give a fuck. Yeah. Uh, the thing that I found funny uh, so me and my girlfriend celebrated our anniversary recently and we went out of town for the weekend and just like stopping like the further away we got from Pittsburgh, the less masks you saw. Yep. Straight. Like there's like, there was so many, like we got to a point where like, even like the sheets, like there's, if you go to a sheets in this, in the Pittsburgh area, it's like face mask must be worn at all times. Yeah. You drive 40 minutes away. There's not a fucking sign anywhere or a mask. Nobody gives a shit. Yeah, either, either that or there are signs, but people are just like, mm, like I'm not really I'm sure. Not really. And like, it's like, I'm curious about like how the. It's so weird how it's like, you know, just a, a, an hour difference. It's like two different worlds at this point. You couldn't have said that any better. Two different worlds, one hundred percent. I don't know, man. I'm curious to see what happens in the next month, month and a half when the you know, school season comes back in. Yeah. I, I just, I don't know. I don't have any idea how to feel about this or what the right thing to do is. There's, uh, it's like, I, I wear the mask, but also like, I'm still, I'll like hang out with people. I'm not doing anything crazy. Yeah. I went to Kennywood yesterday. I was going to ask you how that was because I seen that on Instagram. We, we wanted to go, but we, we got the passes for how they have it set up. Like, you can get passes for 2020 and 2021. Yeah. That's such like we, we did that. We're not planning on going this year. We're going to go next year. Hopefully if everything goes back to semi normal, but how was Kenny Wood wearing? How, how many people were there? There was nobody there. That's what it looked like. Pretty much every picture I've seen you were just like, yeah, there's nobody, nobody. there. It was like, you know, you have to make the reservation. It's a bit yeah. of a pain in the ass, but um, there was really nobody there and they have it like, they have it really locked in. Honestly, like they have um like sanitizers they, they they check your temperature when you walk in yeah. and then they have it set up so all of the lines they have like markers where everything's like they're like socially distant cues mm-hmm. they're only letting people on like every other car every other two cars on the ride so they're only like like half loading or even yeah. sometimes like a quarter loading the rides um they're sanitizing like all of the handrails they make they provide hand sanitizer and they make you sanitize when you get on and get off of each ride wow. on top of them sanitizing everything uh there wasn't a whole lot of people there so the lines were pretty quick which was tight yeah. and there's some stuff that isn't open at all like any of the rides that are super touchy like that ghostwood estate game like where you shoot the you shoot the gun yeah, and shoot yeah, the ghosts. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like that's completely closed. They're not even bothered trying to open that. Noah's Ark is closed. Like anything where it would be like too time extensive for them to yep. sanitize, they're just not opening it. Yeah. 
And then they have like a couple little areas that are like mask break areas where they have like socially distanced picnic yep. tables. So you can like sit down and take the mask off and chill out. So overall it was fairly like it was well, everything was well played. Yeah, played it out. was, it was easy, honestly. And the one thing that I, the one thought that I had was like, I've always had this irrational fear of a bug flying in my mouth on a roller coaster. <laughs> Don't got to worry about it anymore. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, it was cool, man. Like, I think that um, if they continue to do it the way that they are doing it, there was barely anybody there. Like, I've been around more people at the grocery store. Wow. And uh, that's That's good if they're going to be having stuff like that open. Like, it obviously shows that they're ready to deal with it let people you know have that time to be you know for shit to be semi-normal again and be able to go and have a good time without fearing you know what i mean everything sounded like it was very dude i'll tell you this there's some of the stuff like the idea of like them sanitizing stuff and making people hand sanitize i'm down for that forever oh yeah for sure dude like because i mean like Theme parks are kind of gross. <laughs> and and I totally get like I think a lot of people when they think about Kennywood being open, I think they're thinking like, you know, like nuts to butts in the lines, yep. you know, like how it can be, but it was just, it was not Polar that. Opposite. It was not that at all. You know, I, I it felt like 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 like, a, like like you're there for like some sort of like special sneak preview, like you know, like <laughs> it's like like the work it's like the work company Kennywood picnic, but yeah, only yeah. the work company is there. Like well, okay, let me ask you a question on yeah. that. So, like, did you have to pay to reserve a spot or, like... No, well, work? we're season pass holders. Okay. So, you don't have to pay to reserve the spot. You just either have to have a ticket or a season pass. Okay. So, they have it set up where you can buy a ticket that's basically good for any day through the year. Mm-hmm. And then you have to go again and make the reservation for the day that you want to go. It's a little bit of a pain in the ass, I think, for us as season pass holders because we have been season pass holders for a few years. Yeah. And it would be, it's not uncommon for us in the past to be like, we have nothing going on tonight. You know, it's like six o'clock. It's like, let's just go to Kennywood for a couple hours. You know, we'll fucking ride a couple rides, get some funnel cake, stop at Voodoo Brewery on the way home, get some stuff. And like, it's just like a dumb little night because Kennywood's only 20 minutes from here. It's super close. So, um, but now I don't know how realistic that's going to be. Like if we're going to be able to make a reservation for like, Oh, we're coming now make a reservation, you know, but whatever. I'm just glad I got to ride a roller coaster in 2020. (laughs) That's all I'm going to say. So, you know, as we're, Wrapping up here, we've been actually going for an hour and 10 minutes at this point. Has it been that long already? It's been that long. Holy crap. I feel like, you know, we've talked about life. We've talked about family. We've Mm. talked about all of the projects. We've talked about the pandemic. What else is going on? Uh, Pretty much just kind of keep it busy. Uh, I have um, a new Seed album that's fully done, recorded, and mixed and mastered, just taking time. I just dropped an EP a couple months ago back in June. So, well, last month, actually. It feels like it's been longer than that. But I have another album fully done, ready to go. Uh, I'm going to take time. I'm going to do a music video. Uh, just hopefully, I personally, for this, I want to have a CD release party. I want to be able to play a show for it. So just I'm kind of holding off and shelving it for a little bit, just kind of putting the pieces in place and just checking out the market. Um that's the same thing for brutal business we're continuing to put out content we have people we want to uh bring on board to expand the artist roster but it's one of them things uh we're waiting for shows because that's a big thing we offer but we have some very talented bands from the area that are interested in uh if things are good and kind of go back to normal 2021 is looking to be a great freaking year man i'm excited uh nine stitch same thing we just dropped an ep uh Hope we were supposed to start playing shows next month. So we're just kind of crossing our fingers and hoping and just kind of riding the wave and seeing what happens, man. Sure. That's all you can do. I'm hoping for the best, but also like when stuff gets canceled, I'm not like being a brat about it. Like I get it. Yeah. I totally get it. Yeah. But I'm also like, I'm ready to roll because like I feel like 
I know what the fuck these shows are. You know what I mean? Like I can, I'll, I'll play a show with 30 people in a room and feel yep. fine. You know, I, I, I don't know how safe I would even feel like being in like a stage AE type environment right now. Yeah, no, I feel it, dude. You I know? feel it, yeah. But I feel like around people that I know, but also it's not really necessary because it's like all of these people have seen me before. It's like, it's sure, true. It's true. I have some yeah. new music to play, yeah. but they've seen me play. Yeah. They probably don't even remember half of the old fucking songs. Yeah. That, that stuff's probably still new to them anyway. So that, again, that's kind of like setting that ego to the side. And yeah. But that's still like that, that passion. Like, I want to play. That's yeah. why I do this shit. I love playing yeah. live. I don't want to be a studio musician, yeah. you know, but now we're just kind of all forced to do that. Pretty much. Yeah. It's a, uh, and it's been kind of cool too, to watch. Okay, so we've obviously all been dealt this card, but it's been cool to kind of see the musical community like figuring out like okay, like with the uprising of like live streaming concerts and stuff. Like look at uh, Code Orange, yeah, what they did. You know, it was cool, and that was like like that. Like they did that on the fly, and they put put that all together, and it was very well packaged and very well presented. You know, it's it's been definitely a time where bands really need to think about how they're going to market and how they're going to stay relevant and what they can do to adjust. Yeah. I think that it's a, uh, I've, I've, I don't know if I've said it out loud, but I've definitely in my head thought about like, if anything good comes out of this, a lot of the bullshit bands are going to be done. This is like very, yeah. very much a survival of the fittest. It, it really, it, it really, really is. Yes. And I think that whenever we do get shows back, you're going to see like the hungriest people that are doing like the coolest, most like people that are super passionate, just doing like really fucking just like cool driven, like ah type stuff. And, and I'm excited to see that. And I'm hoping that like promoters that are booking shows, you know, I hope they have less bands to pick from. I'm hoping that they also like have they they step outside of their comfort zone and start to like put some other people on instead of like, you know, yep. booking the same show every month yep. at the same place. You know, I think it's going to everybody's going to have to work a little harder. But as a result, I think that the general public is going to get a much better product. I Yes. I couldn't have said that any better. That's a great way to look at it. And I feel that <laughs> you nailed it on the head, dude. That's just that's just plain and simple. Uh, yeah, it's just a matter of when the time for that comes back. Now there are some shows going on. Like, yeah, they just had the Rock for Life up in uh up out past Contanning in Ford City this past weekend. There's some, yeah, there's and like you said, you guys got a show coming up that isn't canceled yet. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I want to just be in a part where I want to be in a position where I can like promote something and not feel bad about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, fuck it. You know, I hope that, uh, I hope that it's sooner than later, but also if we want it to be sooner than later, then I guess we all have to do our part to, uh, yep. you know, Bye. help, help, help flatten the curve or whatever yep. the fuck it is. Yes, sir. Oh boy. I don't fucking know. I'm not a goddamn doctor. <laughs> I'm an idiot with a microphone. Where's a couple of idiots with microphones. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's all we do. We eat microphones 25 minutes uh -huh. at a time. So, uh, fuck dude. With that being said, I'm going to do my outro and, uh, we're going to wrap this up because it's been, it's been quite enough time. 75 minutes. I think that's enough I think for people, good. right? I guess if good. you're still listening to this, we're glad that you're here. And that is all, folks. One more time. Patrick, thank you for being here. Cheers again. Yes, sir. Be sure to check out Nine Stitch Method. Be sure to check out C. Be sure to check out Brutal Business. Be sure to check out like one of the other 2,000 projects he's done vocals on. It's a good dude. But regardless, I'll be back again next week with another episode talking to some other idiot. Same time, same place, same channel. You know the drill. My name is Sykes. Start the beat 2020. Woo -woo. Thanks for listening. And we are done. That's it. That's a podcast. <laughs>